Okay, so welcome to the lecture on cell structure and function. Previously, we were talking about you know, what is life, how do we know it's alive, the features of life, the basic characteristics, and keep in mind, the cell is a basic functional unit of life. That's where we say life, that's the smallest living organism. Mitochondria and Golgi bodies and all these things, they're parts of the cell, but they're not considered living. It's all those little structures that work together to create a cell that makes the cell function and the cell considered alive. Now there's a big, big spectrum on cell diversity. What's out there, the varieties, the types, all sorts of different things. Cells have components to them that enable them to perform specific functions. But we're going to keep it general. We're going to look at the basics of what features are found across pretty much all cells out there, whether it's a bacterial cell, a plant cell, a skin cell in a person, or any other cell out there, whether it's a single-celled organism or a multi-celled organism. That's what we're going to be exploring are the variety and diversity of cells. Okay, so cells, when we talk about these, living organisms are made up of cells. Cells will then have a maximum size that they can attain. They're only going to get so big. Cells cannot become the size of a volleyball, a beach ball, or even a golf ball. They don't get that big. So when we look at cells, generally, when we're looking at cells, we're seeing things in this size spectrum here, 10 micrometers to 100 micrometers in size. Those are your general plant and animal cells. Now, a whale is bigger than a mouse, not because the individual cell is larger, but simply because the whale has more cells. Okay, So it's a lot more cells to make up a blue whale than a mouse, but not bigger cells. So the challenge is, as the cell size increases, it can't hold its shape. So think about a water balloon. You blow it up, and it has a maximum size that is ideal to fill with water, to be able to throw it, to have the effectiveness. If you inflate it even more, it doesn't work real well. It's hard to manage. It's floppy. It doesn't work. It, it, it can rupture. Cells have the same aspect. Too big, try to inflate them too much and they rupture, they don't work. So they all try to achieve a optimal size for their function. Now when we look at cells, generally, this is very general, we group them into two very broad categories. Our first category here is called the prokaryotic cells. These are generally what we call the bacteria. These are the smallest living organisms. Okay. So now, it's not just bacteria. We should say bacteria and the archaea. All right. These are your smallest living organisms on the planet. They're single-celled organisms. They never group together and form multicellular structures. You can have groups of them lumped together to form colonies, but every cell is still independent. Now, the key feature for the prokaryotic cells is that they lack a nucleus. Let me underline that and put it in red. That is a big key feature we want to remember about bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells. They lack a nucleus. Okay, So they have DNA. That's all the squiggly stuff in here. I mean, they have DNA without a doubt. Um, but what they're going to do, so here's their DNA. Their DNA is just in this big loop. We call it a nucleoid region. It's not contained inside a specific structure called a nucleus. Okay, so that's the big feature about prokaryotic cells, bacteria and archaea. Pictures, archaea. Oh. There we go, archaea. So, okay, now with bacteria, when we come across bacteria, they tend to have three key shapes. Bacillus. Bacillus is a bacteria that is rod-shaped. Okay, it looks like a pill. These guys 
over here. These are going to be your bacillus bacteria. Okay, rod shaped, kind of elongated like that. Now, spirillia. Spirillia are spiral bacteria. Squiggly guys. Those are going to be the guys over here. Those are the bacteria that cause things like Lyme disease. Different issues are associated with different bacteria. So here's your Spirillia bacteria over in this picture here. And then our third bacterial type is called Coccus. Coccus bacteria are going to be round-shaped bacteria. Okay, so the last group down on the bottom, down here, those are going to be your Coccus bacteria. All right, so round, circular. They look like little balls. Now, they can string together to form chains, but each individual bacterial cell functions on its own and does everything it needs to by itself. All right, so when you go to the doctor or you listen to the news and they talk about, oh, there's this outbreak of this bacteria, this bacteria, etc., listen for the words. If anybody's ever had streptococcus, strep throat. That's a round-shaped bacteria that's causing your health issues. Pneumococcus. We talk about E. coli. Those are going to be your bacillus-shaped bacteria. And as I mentioned earlier, things like Lyme disease, Spirillia. So a doctor has to know if you're there for an illness, health issue. If you have a bacterial infection, they need to know what is the shape of the bacteria to then start narrowing down what bacteria it is causing your problem so then they know how to counter it. So, okay, so prokaryotic cells, one big broad category that we put all of these bacteria and archaea cells into. The other category is what we call the eukaryotic cells. Remember from classification, domain eukarya. Now these cells, let me get the red out here, the eukaryote cells will have a nucleus. These are going to be structures that contain the DNA of the organism. So corn, rabbits, fish, frogs, cats, oak trees, fungi. So plants, animals, fungi, and all of the protistas all fit into this category of eukaryotic cells because they all have a nucleus. Okay, so now as we dive into the cells, what we're going to look at are the big general features, the key structures, the key features of the cells. Okay, so the easiest thing to do here is don't just watch and listen, but draw a cell while I'm doing this. All right, so take a piece of paper, draw out an animal cell, draw out a plant cell, go through the key structures. What is their job? So be able to make sure you guys can identify structure and function. What does this structure do for the cell? Because later in the semester, we're going to be talking about health issues, diseases. Some of these are simply because a structure inside the cell is not working correctly. Then we'll get into genetics and biotechnology. Can we fix that structure within the cell and make it work efficiently? All right, so animal cell anatomy. Here's your basic features. There's another picture of the animal cell. And then when we get into plant cell anatomy, there's your basic picture, all the key structures that we'll want to take a look at. The other picture as well. Now, the nice thing, there's a big overlap between plant and animal cells with a lot of their structures. There's a lot of similarity. What we'll do is we'll go through the general similar features of both cells, and then I'll highlight and say, okay, here's plant-specific. Here's an animal-specific. Make sure you guys can recognize which structures are found in both cells, but then also which ones are unique to plants, and which one, and there's only one, and that is unique to the animal cell. Okay? All right, so let's start out with the brain. The brain of the cell is the nucleus. So we're going to call it the brain center of the cell. This contains the DNA 
of the individual. So it dictates everything. Controls the cell's actions. Sends out a code, sends out information, tells the cell, do this, do that, build this, make that, do this feature, etc. This is where all the information is stored. So at the moment of conception, when the egg and the sperm fertilized, all that DNA got together, and then as that cell continued to develop, all the DNA was contained within the nucleus. Now the nucleus itself is surrounded by a little membrane. Okay? So it's got this membrane around it that protects it, contains everything, keeps everything in. So this is known as the nuclear envelope. They're highlight in yellow for us. So the nuclear envelope is just a bag. But the neat thing, there's all these little holes in the bag. This allows stuff to go in and out of the nucleus. And primarily, it's stuff's coming out of the nucleus. And we'll get into that when we talk about DNA and we talk about RNA. So the information inside the nucleus has to go out of the nucleus to the individual cell structures telling them what they're supposed to build and create. Okay? The other structure to mention inside the nucleus is this little thing called the nucleolus. This is going to be this dark spot inside of the nucleus. That's going to be an important feature or structure that we also want to take a look at oh, when, we, um, when we're looking at genetics and DNA. So we'll be coming back to these structures. I guarantee it, promise it, we'll come back to all these structures. So if you get them down now, makes everything else much easier for you. So, okay, so that's our brain center. Now attached right next to the brain center is this big squiggly membrane known as the endoplasmic reticulum. Now we call it the rough ER because it actually has these little structures attached to it called ribosomes. Collectively the rough ER is the factory that builds proteins. Okay, so we talked about protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids. Something has to put those amino acids together. That is the job of the ER, the rough ER. There's your protein factory. Okay, so the way it works, the ribosome will actually read the genetic information from the cell, from the nucleus, take that code and say, okay, I'm going to assemble a protein Maybe it's a single level protein, or a second level, or a third level, or a fourth level. But this is where the proteins are all being built, on the rough ER. Now the rough ER is directly connected to the nucleus. So I'm going to zoom back up here for a second. Right there. Alright. So notice here's a nucleus. And this squiggly thing right here, that is going to be your rough ER, this membrane right here. It's going to have all the ribosomes on it. See, there it is. It's labeled in this one. Okay, so nucleus. There's our nucleus. There's our ribosomes. Our rough ER. Now, a little further away from the nucleus is this stuff called the smooth ER. The squiggly stuff out here. Now, the smooth ER is another factory. But this factory... builds fats. So we have a cell structure that makes proteins and a cell structure that makes fats. Rough ER protein, smooth ER fats. So they're both labeled here. Let me highlight them again. There's our rough ER and your rough because of the ribosomes. There's our ribosomes up there. And then the smooth ER, it's a factory, but it's not making protein. Instead, it's building fat. So your cell constantly needs to make stuff. It needs factories to do this, just like a city. So if I want to build a house, I go to one business. I give them my instructions. If I want to make donuts, I go to a different business. I give them the instructions. Cells have to be able to build proteins and fats. But the key is, make sure you get proteins and fats in your diet so we can reuse the basic ingredients to make new structures for ourselves.